This week's podcast is sponsored by Tantalise Beauty, specialising in lash and brow treatments, lash products and lash training. Find them on their website and follow them on Instagram. The link will be in the description. Thank you. Welcome to another episode of the Need of His podcast. Very proud to announce today's special guest, Mr Alex Kearney. How are you, brother? Brilliant, my man. Good to finally meet you in person, mate. Um, I've been really looking forward to this one. You know, I uh, I follow your channel. I like a lot of your stuff. And like I said in my last podcast, you know, there's a, a distance myself and unsubscribe from a massive amount of stuff that I was getting too emotionally involved in. You know, and it uh, feels good, liberating feeling. But I, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of stuff I've got rid of. Like I said, but there's a few channels I keep an eye on. You know, and yours is one of them. I really like your content, mate. You know, it's a lot of positive stuff. <laughs> Really good stuff on training, you know, even breathing when you're training. I mean, when you talk, mate, I listen, you know what I mean? I think you've got a good channel. And I think um, we had a little discussion earlier about how we like to try and keep away from the drama, you know, and I think what's important, you know, to, to recognise with your channel is that, you know, you get, you get the right views. And I'm just going to say, before we go any further, there's a big blue bottle flying around this, um, this studio. And I've just been mentioning there, I think, I don't know what's more foolish, a man chasing his hat down the street in the wind or a man chasing a blue bottle around the studio. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I really like his stuff, mate. And I think what's important to mention is, you know, we're on about before about, you know, the view count and that. And I think a lot of people get carried away with a view count, you know, and they the, the start, the start coming out of their own person to please an audience. You know what I mean? I like yeah. the fact that you don't do that, mate. And I think, I'm, you know, safe to say that, you know, with the views you do get, are the right views for the right reasons by the right people, you know what I mean, watching the right content, Hopefully, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm quite certain of that. And, um, yeah, I've been looking forward to getting you on, mate, so I know a little bit about your background, Special. mate. I'm going to um, I'm gonna let you take the floor in a moment or two, you know, I'd just like you to take us back, you know, when you were, wh where you're from. I know you're from Glasgow, you know, tell us a little bit about your childhood, yep. any memories you've got, you know, and take, take us up to sort of leaving school and maybe, yep. maybe before you joined the Marines, mate. So the floor is yours, brother. Okay, Danny. Thanks very much for having us on. It's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'm from Neilston. It's a wee village in the south side of Glasgow. Small place, you know, five, six thousand people. It's in the country. I would call it a farming community. Uh, Surrounded by countryside, so that was our upbringing. Uh, we had a great upbringing because we had the burns and the dams all around us, so we were all fishermen. Every one of us fished, and that was a big part of our lives. It's still been a big, it's been a big part of my whole life. Uh, had a good kind of group of guys round about me, good friends, lifelong friends, and I'm still in touch with some of them today, although I don't see a lot of them. They, you know, they know who they are and we don't need to see each other. It's that type of friendship. I think we have drifted apart in the past few years, which you could say is unfortunate or you could just say it, it's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole, the whole last couple of years kind of drifted a lot of people apart and it never really helped relationships in general. So I don't see my mates much, but, you know, they know, where, they know who their mate is and... We've always kept it tight, you know, there's only ever been kind of four or five years and that's the kind of nucleus of my friendships. Yeah. And I never required any more than that, you know. I made, a, I, made I think, one or two friends in later life. Uh, my big mate, Luca, I'll give a shout out to Big Luca. He's a great guy, very good way of thinking, great mindset, free speaker, free thinker, exactly what I like. Mm -hmm. So I surround myself with a big man when I when we have time to bump into each other. But, yeah, the great childhood. I, I can't really say anything bad about it, you know. Uh, parents split up when I was about 10. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really remember much of that. I just remember, you know, little bits. I don't have actually a great memory of too much of my childhood. I just know that we made the most of it. So... There'll probably be some, some things there I'm blocking out. You know, I, I do try and kind of reminisce now and again, or I don't even, that's not the right word. I try and jog my memory, but it doesn't work. I mm. don't have the capacity for it. I know it's in there somewhere, but I've as yet been un unable to tap into it. Maybe just too busy looking forward all the time, mate. That's all I'm trying to do, mate, because, you know, 
it's very easy to fall into a, a mindset where you dwell constantly and I do not want to suffer from that. That's an affliction. So positive thoughts only and I have to remind myself of that on a daily basis. Yeah. You know. But So what about schooling, mate? Tell mm. us a little bit about schooling, mate. Primary school and maybe up, maybe up yeah, to St. Thomas's school. primary. Horrible wee school. With a horrible headmaster. <laughs> I had one one decent teacher my whole life, Mrs. Hughes. I think I had her kind of two or three times. I had her certainly twice. We might have had her a third time. Fantastic woman. Still to this day. She's a bit of a legend where we live. Uh, she couldn't see the bad in any of us toe rags. And I wasn't good at school, Danny. I couldn't learn. I just couldn't take it in. And I always knew, always knew there was something going on with me. But back then, you don't have the platforms and the free educate uh, the free information that we have today, which is everywhere. You just have to reach out and grab it. So I've never. I don't think I've really spoken about this. Uh, I used to look at a blackboard, okay, and and get very very confused by it. Right. By the simplest of things. Yeah. So, when I, when the teacher wrote a question up, right, what's the what's the capital of France? And you, and you had time to read it. And then she did that with the duster. Remember the big oak dusters? Yeah. You used to get them smashed off your head. Uh-huh. <laughs> She'd wipe the, the question and it would be gone. Gone. But not only gone from there, gone from me too. I right. couldn't. I didn't. So I'd be like, I'd be looking at what people were writing. <clears throat> so this, I never really knew about this until I was in discussion later in life, where I knew it was an issue because my mate, when we were offshore and stuff, he'd show me so many times how to do something in a computer, and he'd look at me and go, "You're a clever guy. How 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 am I having to show you that ten times? It's the simplest thing." And I'd be like, "Right, shut up. Show me again." So the penny started to drop. I was like, I can't absorb immediate information. It's like an attention deficit type thing. It's an auditory processing disorder. It's part of the dyslexia spectrum. Right. I can't retain immediate information. I have to go back to it and back to it. And, if, and maybe f- three days later, it comes to me. Like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a weird one. Mm. But it always bothered me. And I always knew there was an issue, but it got completely missed in school because we were just seen as troublemakers. And I don't have any grudge about that, right? It doesn't bother me. Mm. Never held me back in life. I, I went and worked all around the world and I earned well and all the rest of it. So I've never been asked in my life for exam results to get a job anywhere. Mm-hmm. Nor have I ever handed over a CV. So I've done all right. So I'm not going to complain. Yeah. But, um, but I was aware of it, so I don't really remember what age I was, 37 or 38, and it was like a what they call a late-life diagnosis where I spoke to a couple of professionals and I brought it up. And within 15 minutes, they were like a couple of simple bits and bobs and a little simple process, and they're straight away like that. You're, and they enlightened me to what was going on with me. It, it's very obvious when you know what you're looking for. But probably 40 years ago when I was at school, I'm 45 now, you know, 37, 38 years ago, mm-hmm. they, they were struggling to know what dyslexia was then. Yeah. Now there's something for it. There's a name for everything, as you know. Yeah. So I st- still to this day, I mean, I can't. You could show me a four-digit sequence and you'd need to sh- keep showing me it five or six times because I would, I would jumble all the numbers and uh, I can't do basic arithmetic at all. Basic maths, even the simplest of sums, it would take me half an hour to work them out. Right. And I would work them out in a way where you would look at it and go, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> it's quite mm-hmm. bizarre. Yeah. So, I would class myself as a dinosaur now by my age, but if I had to go and do a modern set of tests for something, I would probably fail. But I could turn my hand to any kind of line of work. Yeah. I've got logic and a... I've got, you know, I can set a job up and I can run a job. 
no problem. Yeah. But when it comes down to the numbers and stuff, totally defeated by it. I and there is no way to correct it, by the way. There's no... It's not going to happen, and not, and I'm not going to attempt it. I think it's interesting that, mate, because, you know, dyslexia and, ty you know, similar type conditions, you know, that to do with not attention deficit or, you know, maybe the ability to absorb information. What I've found is these people that, you know, I don't want to call it a condition, we'll call it, you know. Yep. These people, they often... Um, excel greatly in other areas do you know what i mean as in even something maybe as simple as sort of a situational awareness yeah definitely you know and the the the, the sort of the make up for the what they don't have say in Absolutely. numbers and processing in other aspects of their life do you know what i mean they seem to be sort of light years ahead of other people when you take the pen out of the hand and stop them doing sums do you know yeah, what i mean you're almost hypersensitive to stuff and yeah uh, acutely aware of we you know we atmospheric changes and stuff and yeah. just people's behaviours, just wee subtle tales. Yeah. I've got great vision. Yeah. And I don't mean I can see for three, which I can anyway, ah. but I've got great vision. Yeah. I see beyond what's right in front of me. Yeah. I've always had that gift. Mm -hmm. I could always see danger coming. Yeah. From a young age. I yeah. could always see it coming. Mm -hmm. Sixth sense. Yeah. So I'm blessed with that in abundance. And that's probably saved me a few times. Yeah. <laughs> So you let, so I take it um, you know your grades weren't exactly shining when you left school. Non, literally non-existent. Aye. Non-existent. I just couldn't do it, Danny. I Aye. just couldn't sit and do it, and I've mm. never been able to do it. Aye. Uh, I've never been able to sit and study and retain information. It, it, it doesn't. I've I've looked at training manuals and online audio stuff, and it doesn't work. So whatever is going on in my mind, be it a mental block, I just it just won't happen. But I can recite poetry in the hundreds, uh, some of the most complex English literature. I can recite it, and Aye. so you know, there's a bit of a bit of a kind of grey area there. If I'm attuned to something, if I really, really enjoy something, I'm obsessive by it. Mm. I'm completely and utterly consumed by it. Like when I discovered war poets, uh, Second World War war poets. Most of them, most of their works were published posthumously after their death. So these guys were found with poems in their tunics in the front lines and like the northwest frontier and Flanders and the Somme and places like that. And their wives would send them to local newspapers and have them published. Men like Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon. And I, I discovered them in a, a bookshop in Plymouth and I, I developed an immediate obsession with war poetry, which I write to this day myself. And uh, I, I know everything about it. I know everything there is to know about it. You know, all the obscure stuff because it's a complete lifelong obsession. But, but you know, but I couldn't subtract 38 for 42. It would take uh -huh. me 20 minutes to do it. I see. I think that's a very so, fascinating uh, observation. And it wasn't long ago, mate, I was speaking to somebody about this. You know, um, you know, in a sense of what we were sort of speaking about before, you know, but a bit deeper, you know, as in we are who we are. Yeah. Now, I think there's something for me quite spiritual about what we are interested in because you have no choice over it. You can't decide to like something. Do you understand? You can't, Danny. You, you, and I think there's something very sort of spiritual about that yeah. because it's out of our hands. Yeah. You know, people are interested in what they are interested in. They can't, I would have no interest in learning you know, none Czechoslovakian or something that I had very zero interest in the ability and the chance of me to be able to do that and absorb that information yeah. would be zero. Correct. I totally agree with you. You know, and when we talk about getting into high school, I've got a my sister's a highly regarded school teacher, so there's a bit of abrasion <laughs> there, <laughs> and, you know, in reference to my views of the education system mm -hmm. and the education curriculum, which is archaic, it's prehistoric, it's yeah. completely out of touch. You know, teach kids about mortgages, teach kids about inflation, teach kids about, uh, you know, the stereotypical, stereotypical company yeah. owner, right, CEOs, and how ruthless they are and how they get there. Mm -hmm. Because these people are rare. 
They're yeah. in a really small percentage. They're the great white sharks of the of the, of the city. They're they're vicious by nature, but okay because they've got a intellect and a drive that is not normal. It's way above average. And I've had drive, and I have an entrepreneurial streak that I really only realised about when I gave up alcohol and stuff like that, and my brain came to life. It just came to life. And I realised I've got a really acute kind of understanding of, you know, what people see in their perception of a like a high-end coffee shop, a boutique-style coffee shop, for instance, what jumps out at you and what draws you immediately to it. Sign writing in a van, for instance. I know what works and I know what's generic. So 50 vans will pass you, you won't pay them a second glance because it's not been thought out. The colour spectrum's all wrong. And then one will go by you and you'll be like, oh, look at that. Mm. Painter, but they've done something. Yeah. It's just went and lit you up. So I'm I'm happy with that side of it. I, the side I'm good at and the side I can develop, I know what I'm good at. Mm. But when I left high school with no qualifications and it was a complete and utter waste of my time, I always felt crippled by the classroom because I just couldn't do it. It wasn't working for me. So it was a complete failure and a complete waste of years. That's why I'm so against the education system, mainly for boys that you can't put 30 boys in a classroom and expect every one of them to learn French. It is divisive and it is... It is very poorly thought out because we had a guy in our class who was a natural artist, right? Incredibly talented uh, at, at drawing and painting. And then I couldn't paint to save myself because it's a gift. Mm -hmm. So how can he get a one and I get a six or he gets an A and I get an E? I completely fail, right? How can that be fair? Where, where by birthright he's gifted, yeah, right? I don't have a choice in that. So all of the odds are stacked in his favour. So he goes into the credit class and I go into the foundation with the Dunces. And we all just end up having a riot. Mm -hmm. So then we leave school and we can't get a job. But he can. It's a brilliant point, that. So it's very divisive and it's not right. It's it it's it's completely and utterly flawed. The, the education system in this country is completely flawed. Mm -hmm. Anything I've turned to my hand to in my life, I've done well at. Purely by grit and determination. Not because I was a, a scholar. Mm -hmm. or I was gifted, you know, with numbers or mathematically. So I've got a, I've developed a real, real, real hatred for the whole thing around education. I can't stand that they can put 50 kids in a class and expect them all to achieve this when one will be super at this and what and those things that are super will be missed. Yeah. That young guy or that young girl will never get an opportunity. Yeah. Because the numbers didn't stack up and they go to somebody and they go, well, I'm taking him. He could be a pudding, mm -hmm. a donkey. And this guy here that couldn't do it in the class can do it in real life. What what skill did you ever learn in a classroom that you've took to real life? Good point. Probably a, the only one would probably be defending yourself from somebody jumping you from behind. Mm -hmm. It's a really good point that, you know, it's funny enough having this conversation with me, with me last three days ago about this generic, you know, format in school and, you know, what they regurgitating facts, you know, and passing it off as intelligence, you know. Now, I think, you know, you brilliant, made a brilliant point there, which we, we spoke about, you know, for one, everybody's good at something. Everybody. Absolutely. And for two, you know, the... Um, the things that I think should be generic and the things that I should think should be taught to everybody aren't, you know, things like, do we said before, situational and emotional awareness, yep. you know, self-respect, respect in general, you know. I think these sort of things should be genetic and across the board. But like I say, I think it's about weaning out what people are good at yeah. and magnifying that instead of, like you say, 
putting a handful of people in, in a classroom and expecting them all to come up with the same same answers and the same results and to supposed to achieve an across the board standard by like you say basically regurgitating facts and sort of passing it off as intelligence you know that's not they're good. still teaching algebra Danny. it's not good schooling you they're know? still teaching algebra and long division hmm. what have you ever long divided in your life <sighs> nothing that i can remember right uh -huh. There's still a few relationships, maybe. Yep, and you, <laughs> so the Catholic schools in Scotland will teach French. The Protestant schools will teach German. I've got no idea why to this day. No idea why. Right, ninety-five percent of people feet shy will never go to France or Germany. If you're going to teach anyone a language, teach them Spanish. It's used throughout the modern world. Teach them Portuguese. They can go anywhere with those two languages. They can speak it all over South America. Yeah. The, the, the Latin America, you know, the Hispanic. Teach them that. Mm -hmm. Why are you teaching them two languages which fundamentally are absurd? German is literally impossible to learn. So it, it's, it's, I need to come closer. <laughs> uh, we're still, you know, they're still beating that drum. Division, division, division. There's a school built recently in Scotland and all the kids are allowed to play themselves at lunchtime, but when the bell goes, they go through two separate doors. Divided by religion. You're, I don't care what anybody says, you're still creating division. They sit in one classroom and go, why are all the boys in there, right? Say, say they're Sikh with headdress on, it. there's division there. Teach them in the same class. Teach them about one another's cultures. Teach them respect. Don't divide them mm. by a book. Because again, a huge percentage of them will never read that book. So why are you ramming it down their throat at five and six and ten year old? Don't. If you don't want people to hate each other, don't teach them to. It's very simple. Yeah. But... The people in power pulling the strings, the puppet masters, they don't have common sense. They have accountants and they have luxury and they need to maintain that. So they indoctrinate the lower classes into hate, division, fear, the narrative of power right across the globe. It's, it never changes. It will never change until people change and put their hand out and say, stop. We don't want to hear this anymore. I don't want to put my kids into a system of indoctrination where you're going to poison their minds with that narrative that you've been piping out for years. It's just ridiculous. It's, it's not an education system. It's an indoctrination. It's a fear system. It's a fear factory. Don't talk. Don't run. Listen. Don't, don't. Everything's don't in a classroom. Kids should be should be talking. They should be communicating. You can't be expected to go to school for eight hours a day and, and sit there in silence and listen to a teacher talking about the history of China when you live in the east end of Glasgow. It doesn't mean anything to you. Mm -hmm. And then they write in your report card, will not concentrate. I'm not concentrating because I'm a human being and you're talking crap and I'm, I'm bored. Mm -hmm. I'm bored. Yeah. Teach me something that's going to get me out there in the world. Teach me about people that are going to try and, you know, fleece me. Teach me how to be an entrepreneur. Teach me how to earn a living with the skill set I have. Don't teach me chemistry and physics. <laughs> right? <laughs> Where in life am I going to use them? Mm. I don't know a, phys a physician or a chemist, do you? No. Right, well, I don't. <laughs> it's a brilliant point. Brilliant Danny, point. Danny, you said something like there, right? About, about this regurgitating information. Right. My short term memory, by diagnosis, is non existent, right? It's non existent. So this conversation will come back to me in a few days' time. But I couldn't tell you just now what we spoke about five minutes ago. So if I go over old ground, correct me. Sure will. you will, you'll kick me under the table. I will do, mate. Right? So, you said there about regurgitating information. See, when you've got a good memory 
a sharp memory for the current, the immediate. You can memorise any book that they teach you, so you'll get the grade ones and the A's in the class because you've got a good memory. That doesn't mean you're better than me. That just means you've got a good memory. Yeah. That doesn't mean anything. Another brilliant point. I know what I can do with my hands. I know what I've done with my hands. Right? You've got a good pair of hands. You're a grafter. You can earn a wage. But because I because I suffer from a wee bit of poor memory, I'm away down here in the food chain in the pecking order. When I got out of school, I bypassed everybody I went to school with. And anything I did, I just put myself out there, not afraid of failure, go and try anything, tested myself from I was 18 years old to the extremes. And I will not be judged. I refuse to be bracketed by an education system for the rest of my life. Yeah. You're not entitled to apply for that job because you don't have a good memory. You can't memorise a crap textbook with stupid, dirt, ridiculous mathematic equations in it. I've never had to do a mathematic equation in my life. <laughs> so it's wrong. Yeah. Or I'll be called extreme or a conspiracy theory. Call me whatever you like. I don't care. It's irrelevant to me. I know me and I know my train of thought. And no one alive will convince me that they're right about the about educating children in this country. We're wrongly educating them and we're poorly equipping them for the real world where all the sharks are out circling all the time. You're taking them out of a sheltered environment in a classroom with a teacher that's probably stressed out her head with anxiety and you're throwing them right you're basically throwing them to the lions putting them out there with no real education a proper street education trading cryptocurrencies real how to make money how to really make a living how to really make a change but do you know what we never teach in classrooms how to be a good human being Mm -hmm. when did you ever get a lesson in humanity never they don't tell you about picking your mate up giving somebody a punty up or they don't talk about addiction and stuff like that you know now they're pushing an agenda in Scotland about educating 8 year olds and above about sex you know that's a that's a government schedule that's out just now that we're on mass campaigning against. That's a that's a parental right to educate your children about that. Not a stranger in a classroom that's unqualified to do that because that's a parent's job. Yeah. When you start taking away parental rights, then what? Then you don't have parents. You just have keepers. So who's got the control here? Nobody should be making decisions like that, but they are. And the public are not aware of this. But it's all out there and you only have to read the small print. And it's horrific what they're wanting to tell children and for reasons I can't understand. It's, it's sinister. It's not right. But then again, I'm not surprised because the whole system's wrong. The whole system's back to front. It's upside down. It's outdated. It just doesn't work for modern this modern world that we live in. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree with so that. I, so I left school with nothing to answer your original question. Yeah. And my life started the minute that I left school. And so did my education. A real world education. Yeah. Not the, you know, not that whole charade that they're, yeah. that they're banding is learning. It is not learning. You know what's important to yourself. You know what you know. You know the skills that you need because you feel them and you feel that you need to know them. Yeah. You know, and like you just said there, another brilliant point about watched another thing. I like. I used to watch a lot of documentaries on similar type things, a range of subjects, to be honest. And there was a a study, and it was the difference between really and how they're so closely related in schools between intelligence and memory. You know, if somebody can tell you an equation and you can remember it, that makes you shine more than the next person. 
Well, there's nothing creative about that. Nothing at all. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's zero creativity. But you, yet you, you know, and the blur and the lines between memory and intelligence, because you know there's an answer for everything, and yep. it's already taught to you. And if you don't remember it, you're seen as lesser intelligent, which you know is the system of schooling today in general. Yeah. You know, but in reality, you know, as this study showed, you know, it was very interesting. You know, that couldn't be any further away from the truth. Yeah. You know, there's a well-known British celebrity. Uh, you know, twenty million followers an apparent guru in spirituality and all the rest of it, who watches social media and absorbs and memorises the bits that are trending to the masses. So whatever, you know, is proportionate to the largest number, he'll take that because that's what's trending. That's obviously what people want to hear. He'll regurgitate, he'll hash it up. He articulates well, he's got great grammar. He'll rehash it and regurgitate it as his Days after it's days or a week after it's trended elsewhere under a slightly different banner. <coughs> Excuse me. And this guy's made made millions of pounds doing that, right? And it's, it's you know he's took his his platform public and then he's exploited people's tendencies to be gullible because we view celebrity as the rule of thumb or the word of law. So if a celebrity says something, the majority of people take it as gospel because mm -hmm. a celebrity said it. Yeah. That's like believing the headlines in a, a newspaper. I mean, you would have to be stupid to believe anything in print in a newspaper. When British media has been controlled by Rupert Murdoch for 50 years, who's a known fraudster, and an absolute deeply sinister individual, up to all sorts of skullduggery, richer than than we would ever understand, wealth that we couldn't begin to comprehend. You know, these people live behind walled, you know, protected, secure. They don't m intermingle with the public. You would never get close to these people. 24 hours se uh, security to protect them. And they've been controlling the narrative in this country for decades and the working man coming from his job or going out in the morning when you were apprentices you buy a paper roll it up put it under your arm because that's what you saw so you emulate that and you sit at lunch and you read the sun or the daily star or one of these rag papers that's put together by an absolute horrible entity of a man like him so they've controlled the nar narrative printing that diatribe that absolute guff and calling it news headlines sensationalism lies what, what journalist has ever took a story and printed it word for word never creative license they call it they just change it to sell if you tell them 10 they'll print 20 they, they can't they couldn't lie straight in bed they lie as easily as they breathe they're paid to do it. <laughs> and and newspaper sales are in decline, hence the closure of news agents all over the country by the hundred every month. And good, brilliant. Now we have some platforms where maybe truth speakers and free speakers that don't fear reprisal can get a, a voice out there and can start to tell people really what's happening in the world. You know, the, the BBC's coverage of what's happened in the Ukraine is, is lies. They posted an image of three guys on a Land Rover that was taken 15 years ago. They were three Royal Marines. I served with one of them. But that was apparently took in the Ukraine. It's a stock image. And no one questions it. The narrative, no one yeah. questions it. They just accept it. There's a guy on the ground, the next Marine. He's a freelance journalist. And he, he only prints the truth. He's got no bias to anything. And what he's seeing is not what they're telling the public. What's happening there is not what the public are seeing. I won't go too far into that because it, it's a whole different tangent. But they lie as easily as they breathe. Yeah. Why are we allying with one side? America's sending one side weapons, we're allying, we want... Why? That's been going on for a hundred years with those two. 
it has got nothing to do with us. But when you look beyond it, there's certain pipelines that they need to control of, there's certain avenues and routes that they need control of. It's all about logistics. It's all about logistics. And sadly, it's all about oil. So, it's all, you know, mm-hmm. don't b- believe anything you want. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I read for my own, uh, my, my own indulgence, do you know what I mean? I'll educate myself and I'm, it's for me. Nothing I say, no one has to take anything I say on board. If you want to listen, listen. If you don't, don't. It's fine either way. I'm not trying to convince anybody. But I look beyond the curve and everything that they do is for reasons way beyond what's in print. And they're all in it together and there's always an agenda. You know, they ring fence their act on an illegal invasion, on a lie. Weapons of mass destruction. They knew a year before they went into Iraq that it was a lie. And two million innocent Iraqis paid with their lives. I mean, that's shameful. And to this day, no one's ever been to The Hague on a war crimes tribunal. And the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, is a war criminal. And I've had my, I've had my social media banned for printing that, writing that on my, my page on my wall. I don't care. It's a yeah. fact. There's a guy that leaves office and all of a sudden he's got a £50 million property portfolio in Mayfair in London. Well, that's got to be mortgage fraud because the maths don't add up. Because a, P, a, a PM's expenses and salary is public knowledge. It's in the public domain. So it's, so it's mortgage fraud. It's mathematically impossible to accumulate the wealth to sustain those mortgages. But nobody will look at him for that because he's untouchable. Is he going to go on a dock and have a public trial like Johnny Depp and his former spouse? Of course he's not, because he's untouchable. Just the same as today, you know, you've got people in royal families sending strangers £12 million for their silence, people they've never met. You don't send strangers £12 million, Danny. Mm, I like this talk, mate. You don't? You just don't. Now, if I did it and if it was me, the entire population of the UK would be going, you're at it. (laughs) And I would be dragged through and it would be civil trial. Nothing. Nothing. I pass. Again, but that's another tangent for another day. Mm -hmm. Because that's a... (laughs) <laughs> that's a very deep hole to go down yes it is and there's a lot of darkness down there you know it gets darker the further you go there isn't only one shade of black mate there are many many shades of black and there are many levels of darkness and they're all down the rabbit hole but they, but they have the wealth and they have the barrister ship and they have the QCs you know we get the run of the mill lawyer on the high street next to the pub across the road for the court these guys get barristers and QC representation. They're untouchable. It's a club, and we're just not in it. Yeah. Not nor would you want to be. Mm-hmm. But you don't send strangers twelve million quid. And unfortunately, we live in this little island where it is governed a very specific way by a very specific percentage of people. And that is a business transaction that works for them but doesn't work for us. So our, re- our representation is, uh, 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 you know, it, it's wrongful but it suits those in power. And effectively we don't have a leg to stand on which is really, really sad for us because the British people are decent people. The Scottish and the English, you know, are decent people fundamentally the Scottish people are not war mongers they don't want to go and go to war with MD. they don't it is being forced on us and the rest of the world are hating us and when people come to this country and blow up buses in London and blo- detonate bombs and trains everyone's outraged don't go poking other people with a stick and dropping bombs on their children going to school and not expect reprisal don't do it. Don't stick your nose into the Middle East, into Muslim countries, right? This is a Christian country. If you want to go down that road, I don't give a shit about religion. 
you this country does not understand that country's politics or how those people live and govern themselves. Don't stick your nose in there. I've worked there, I've lived and breathed it, and I only met good people in Iraq. Don't poke them with a stick, expect them not to do nothing. There are extreme individuals in every walk of life. You poke somebody with a stick long enough, right? You drop a bomb and kill their children, you expect them not to retaliate. Don't be outraged when they blow you up on a train. Don't be outraged at all by it. I'm only surprised it doesn't happen more. And I don't care who that upsets because as a former serviceman, I was part of that mechanism. I was a cog in that machine. You know, when I was lesser educated at 18 year old, years old when I joined up. And you don't have, we don't have the power of hindsight when we're young and all we want to do is get on in life. I was an apprentice mechanic, Danny, and it, because of what's going on with my head, I never understood mechanics very well. So I was the chief floor sweeper. That's not a life. I just knew I'm not going to do well at this. I need to be tested. I need to try it. And then I saw this sign and I went down that journey. You know, Royal Marines. Yeah, had to do it. Had to do it. The minute I saw it, I had to do it instant. It was like that. I knew nothing about the military. I never had a clue about the military. I didn't even know what the Royal Marines were. Like 99.9% .9 need not apply. You thought that's for me. Yeah, there was. there's two careers offices in Glasgow and Queen Street. One's Army Stroke Parachute Regiment. And as I'm walking down, you know, I rattled that door and he's sitting there and he's eating a sandwich, his lunch, and he's like, what is it? And I said, I want in. 18 year old. Yeah, he's like, nah, I'll come back later. I went, no, no, I want in, you need to open up. And he's like, come back later. And I was like, Pfft. so I walked, went next door and it was the Royal Marines careers office and I walked in and he, he was a very different kind of guy. He just stared at me. And I was like, how are you doing? And he just stared at me and never said a word. He's like, and I says, can I get some information and in that I'd like to join up? And he's like, what do you know about core history. So the Royal Marines, we call them the core of the Royal Marines. I says, I don't, what's core history? I, I don't even know what a core is. What, what are you talking about? And he, he was like, so you don't know anything about them? I said, well, I know that they're better than them next door. So he laughed. And he, yeah, the rest was history. All right. So talk me through a little bit about that, mate. I told you about always having the same pals, so my pals, we were all fit, we all ran, we were all runners in uh, you know, boxing clubs and stuff, just fit by players. I wasn't a fit by player, my mate played professionally. But we were always fit and I always did a thing about running everywhere. So you go to the dancing in the Glasgow and where we lived was 10 mile away. You'd leave the dancing at three in the morning and I'd jump onto the train tracks and run home three in the morning drunk the Timberlands on and I always the thing about running everywhere and although I'm built like a bear I'm a really good runner strangely mm. enough I've got a good engine for it I can drag my carcass up and down the miles and uh, we were in a pub one day we were having a pint my mate says in the time we drink these pints I'll bet you couldn't run to Neilston it's like three and a half four mile I says I bet you I could so I went like that, necked my pint and bolted straight out the Before door. Before you joined up? Yeah. Yeah. Starts running. And uh, I just ran. I just ran. I mean, I can take the pain. Got a really high pain tolerance. Timberland boots on. My feet are killing me. I'm just charging, charging because I I just refuse to be beat. And uh, I gets up the road, jumps the, the fence. I'm lying in the grass at my mum's house. And they pull up in the car and they're all giggling and laughing. Ah, he must be doing it. There's a wee lane that comes through to the like the Barhead Road to where we live. Ah, he must be doing there because we, we we're here and we've no seen him. And then they opened the door and heard me breathing. I was lying in the grass and they were rolling about laughing. And this story got told for years and it's been told a few times. Mm. And uh, it doesn't grow arms and legs. It's just a mad story. And I was, I was on a door working one night and a guy came up to me and he went... I was in a bar one day, he says, and I saw your mates daring you, and he told me this story, 
and he recited it and he's like, I was sitting and you charged out that door like a bull and you were gone. He says, and then I saw years later that you joined the Marines. He says, that was right up your street. So I like to be, I like to be tested, Danny, but not next to somebody. Let me explain that. If it was me and you, right, and you were better than me at something, I don't have an issue with that. I want to try and catch up for me. I'm in competition with myself. I want to see what I can do. You do 10 three-minute rounds in the bags and you're barely breaking sweat, I would say, right, I want to, I want to do that. I want to get like that for me. Yeah. It's not for anybody else to comment on. So I'm in competition with me. Can I run 20 miles with 60 pounds in my back in under three hours? Can I do it? I, I can do it. Mm -hmm. So now that I've told myself I can, now I need to actually physically go and crack it. And if I fail three times, I'll do it four. So it was always just about myself, you know? It was always about what can I do? I knew I had something in me and my pals just to say, you're a nutter. And not in a, not in a bad way, just because I would do physical things. I wanted to be tested. And I wanted to see what I could endure. And I wanted to, so people would say to me, like I went to the pub and I'd say, I'm joining the Marines, I'm going away in a couple of weeks. Join the army first. Why? Because it's easier. Go into the army first and do two years and then transfer. And I never knew what that meant. And I just looked. You didn't have online then. You had brochures. And I'd go, be the best, Royal Marines, da 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 That's the one for me. Nothing else would even enter my mind after that. And to this day, they are the best of all the services. And I'm not being biased. I've got great friends in the parachute regiment and all the rest of it. But there are no soldiers. There are no one anywhere that soldiers like the Royal Marines. The training is nine months for a reason. And the process is long and arduous for a reason. 15 weeks to break you down, 15 weeks to build you up. It works. It's proven that it works. They've fought in every major battle in the last two or three hundred years. Their, their, their CV speaks for itself. I recommend it to anybody. I don't recommend... I don't recommend it for everybody, i.e. in a sense that, like, say, you mentioned National Service in your video where you're talking about your grandpa. In the old days, yes. Today, no. Young guys are now struggling with their sexuality, with this. With, those young guys don't fit that mould. They would be bullied and, they would, and somebody, some moron would exploit them. Times have just changed too much in yeah. my lifetime. But when I was that age, I gave myself to the process. We were thrashed by sadistic, brutal corporals. And I loved every single minute of it. Because on day one, I told myself, this is a game. They can't kill me. They can't kill me. So as long as I can convince myself of that, then I can see this process through. And believe me, they do try and kill you. <laughs> but, you know, it was good. And I, and I did enjoy it. And it, and it was life-changing. And it does let you know who you are. And there are times where you're... You're destroyed, they've wrecked your body, they've run you ragged for 18 miles through the night in January in Dartmoor with an obscene amount of kit on, you haven't ate for two days. And you'll say to yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I here? I could be in the pub with my mates. That's a very difficult thought train to overcome. <laughs> your mates are in the boozer now. It's a nice winter's night, it'll be snowing in Neilston, it's really high up, it gets deep. They'll be outside the pub at closing time having a snow a snowball fight, steaming, going to parties, and I'm crawling through a river in Dartmoor. <laughs> mm -hmm. I quite enjoyed it. Right. I, I enjoy it. I'm probably a bit masochistic to myself. I, I still torture myself to this day. I still try and do more press-ups than I'm capable of doing. I still set myself mad targets. I'm going to do 25 pull-ups. It's going to take me two weeks to build up to that. And I'll be absolutely raging if I can only do 17. Because some days, you know yourself, you feel strong. And other days, you just don't. 
Yeah. You've maybe ate right, you're maybe properly hydrated, other days you're just not, even though when you think you are, and you just kind of get that last couple of pull-ups out and you come off the bar and I'm in a bad mood. Yeah. And I'm like, grow up, you mad man, it's nobody here. You're out in the middle of no nobody can see you doing this, calm down. But it's in there. But see, to me, I like that. And to me, that's the importance of it. You know, that's the importance of it there. And it's somewhat what you don't get today. Very, very rare in people who compete with themselves. Yeah. It just doesn't happen anymore. Now everybody's influenced by all these outside influences, social media, and everything else that goes with it. People trying to achieve unimaginable levels of beauty, unimaginable levels of fitness Possibly. because they're comparing to somebody else. You know what I mean? I really like that about, you know, being in competition with yourself at the end of the day. Everybody's different. If you can make progress on a personal level, be it physical, be it mental, be it spiritual, you know, that's a brilliant thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And progress, be it even in micro stages, is progress. Yep. You know, comparing yourself to somebody else is not progress. Comparing yourself to somebody else is probably, by definition, you know, restricting what you can do and restricting the levels that you can get at, you know, because you're concentrating on something else and something yeah. something else, somebody else's level, other than where you are and what you can do to improve it, you know? Very good point, mate. I like that. I like that a lot. And I, I think, think it's good to compete with yourself. Of course it is, mate. You know, old, who uh, are you? Well, this is it. Who are you? Yeah, exactly. Who are you? And everyone's You know different. who you are? Yeah. And because all, in, and there isn't in, a man, woman or alive that's... that's, that's, that's the exact replica of somebody else, you know. We're, in, we're called individuals for a reason, you know. Yeah. I want to... I, I will say this, Danny. Even though I achieved things at a young age, you know, I did have a good several years in the Royal Marines. Met amazing guys, we're still in touch. A lot of great times, a lot of sad times, a lot of men buried, you know. The aftermath is the suicide pandemic. Uh, veterans, you know, post-traumatic stress, all of those things. That's a life sentence. You never you're, you, you never become not a part of that. I've got guys on the phone to me regularly. Some of them I haven't seen in 15 years. We talk like we were in a room together yesterday. Uh, the level of suffering for some of these guys is off the scale. I've had my own issues with depression. Speak openly about it. No one will... No one will call me weak. There's nothing weak about me. Uh, this whole taboo, you know, about if you're it's weak. And my uh, twenty years ago, it would have been seen as a weakness. Thankfully, now we're we're exposing ourselves to information, and I can say, well, folk will go as you're weak-minded if you're depressed or you need help or you need to speak to somebody bullshit right I know who I am I know what I put myself through I know how many times I put my neck on the line so if you're going to if you're going to talk at least talk sense don't talk rubbish I've never met a weak guy in the Royal Marines there are so many different guys in it not every guy in the services is a you know a fight, uh, you know, a fighting guy, or some of them are very intellectual. I served by a guy that was fluent in seven languages. He had five degrees. I was like, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> He's like, "I love it." So, and he just wanted to soldier. He had that need of confrontation, of conflict. I was talking somewhere, Danny, in a group of people, and I said that I felt comfortable in conflict, i.e. any conflict, confrontation. I felt really calm in it. And he's like, that's just weird. I says, well, it's, it's not weird to me. I says, maybe you feel calm watching Netflix and lying on the couch. I don't. I feel irritated. I says, that's why I don't own a television. I feel calm in conflict when somebody's putting me under direct pressure and I can see what am I capable of? Can I handle this? How far does this go? Mm. It's about levels. So that's just, again, it's maybe it's masochistic. Maybe I'm doing myself a disservice, but that's my makeup. Genetically, that's who I am. And I would say I treaded water for years doing 
things offshore and here, there and everywhere. But in the past few years, like yourself, your journey's been an interesting one. And, you know, when we spoke originally and stuff, I, I saw people critiquing you and criticising you and saying, this is a charade, you're, it's a phase, that, that this guy can't change. All the keyboard experts, all the all the keyboard warriors, you know, with the big balls hiding behind a couch with a fake name, blah blah blah, <laughs> and uh, all calling you out. Yeah, right. I've got a great, uh, I've great, I've got a great vision for picking out specific people and say, right, you're a proper antagonist here, poking at you. It'll be somebody that knows you, but they don't have the balls to declare themselves to you, so they're a non-entity. They don't. They don't exist in my world. They don't matter to me, yeah. because I, I I'm under my name. Everywhere I go, on any platform. So yeah. I don't I don't have fear of someone coming to me. Why would I? Yeah. We are all equal, aren't we? Because really, you know, we all have eight pints of blood. We're all breakable one way or another. So no one's got anything on me. Do you think? You know, because I wanted to question you about the name of your channel, mate, you know, and we'll go into a little bit about that shortly. AC coming back to life. Do you know, do you think um, you chose that for a reason? Because I know you go on about a lot, you know, you love to see yeah. people come back to life. Yeah. You know, was there, a, was there a phase there where you think, you know, you weren't living life the yeah. life that you wanted? And I'm a big Pink Floyd fan, and it's a, it Bingo. was on the division bell, Bingo. coming back to life, and it's right. it my favourite song in the album. It's just a great album. It's Dave Gilmer's album. And... Uh, Everybody knows the song. It's a great song, and I just thought, is that too long for a name in YouTube? Because I'm quite creative. I could come up with something really catchy, but I just liked it, and it's st it stuck. And uh, I thought, no, do you know something? It means something to me. It's personal. I'm just going to go with it, yeah. and uh, I'll make it work regardless. Yeah. Because I'm not a quitter. Never walked away from anything in my life. Never encountered another problem that I couldn't solve. And I was always very good at solving other people's problems as well. Which is a part of my life I've now closed down. I now no longer solve people's problems. I was really busy solving people's problems for years, mate. And I was ignoring my own life. And family suffer and partners suffer and... Everybody else got my time. But when it mattered, really, they didn't get my time in the amounts that they should have. And as, as I said, we're not blessed with hindsight. You know, you've spoke openly about your own relationships and failures and things like that. And, you know, we all have it and we carry that guilt. Now that I've got a clear mind and I've, as, and I've got as close to a pure mind as, I, as I've ever had in my life, I've still got a lot of work to do. I'm getting somewhere. And, I, and I'll talk about anything and I'll expose myself to anything. Yoga all sorts of stuff that I would would have been deeply sceptical skeptical about in the past and go, piss off, that doesn't work. Of course. Yeah. But Danny, you get to a point where you're trying to be a man. We, we know what projection is. You're 25, 21, you're in the pub. You're trying to project that you're one of the top three tough guys in that pub. Right? You're trying to project it. So you do anything to project it. You might roar the loudest. You know, you might get involved when there's a Barney and shout the loudest and if anybody does anything to him, you'll be dealing with me, all that kind of crap, right? All that fake rubbish that we all got up to in our youth. And everybody's projecting something. But when you know who you are truly, there's no longer a requirement to project because you know you're capable. Yeah. You know you can handle your own affairs. And you know that if... It's 50-50 that you, the odds are stacked in your favour because you've trained, your, you know, you, you've put the effort in. So you've maintained yourself for that rainy day yeah. where somebody comes knocking. And I don't just mean in a physical way, I mean in every way. When somebody what, challenges exactly you. exactly what you mean. Or in, in every field. Yeah. If you prepare, you've got a much, much better chance of success across yeah. the whole spectrum of events that could occur. Yeah. In the lives that we live, yeah, in the environments that we put ourselves into, these things cease happening when you take yourselves out of those environments. Yeah, when you're not in pubs, t 
today, we, you know, most of the young guys are on steroids and coke and drink, and it's a an absolute recipe for disaster when you've got a pub full of them. Yeah. And they're all beefed up. Some of them are strong. They're all doing jiu-jitsu, you know. In my days, it was punching that one fights. Today, they're cho get anaconda chokes on the yeah. deck and uh -huh. while somebody's hitting you with a pool cue. It's just madness. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, so everything evolves, but I'm trying to evolve. I'm yeah. trying to evolve to see who I really am. Yeah. Because I've always known that... It's growth, isn't it? It is, and I've always known I'm capable in many ways. But I believe I'm even more capable. But what I, what the most capable thing I want to be is being capable of being a good person yeah. and looking at myself in the mirror down the line and saying, you got it right in the end. You did it the right way in the end. It took you a while to get here. But you've left a good account of yourself. Yeah. You know, do no wrong. Don't harm people. Don't do stuff like that. And try and set an example. Certain things <clears throat> happen to us as people you know, which it might not be an incident or it might not be a conversation, but it's more a realisation, you yep. know. And I've had many awakenings in the past year or so, let's say, of, you know, spiritual, emotional, and many awakenings I've experienced. And what they do to me, a real awakening for me, you know, gives me the, the recognition, I like that word, it gives me the recognition to completely reconfigure the way not only that I live my life, but the way that I think, you know. And I've had many awakenings, especially since I've been in recovery, and I think that's important, and I think that happens to everybody, and I think you need to notice when those things happen. You know, you I remember at certain times, and I remember them simply because it was almost like an opening of the brain what was never there. It was the realisation of something that I was maybe doing wrong or something that I wasn't doing right. Now... You know, when these things happen, you know, it changes us at the direction for the better. 99% it's for the better. It changes the direction that we're going on. It changes the frequency that we operate on. And it changes our energy completely as people, you know? Absolutely. And I think a one that happened to me about a year ago, you know, and there's been many, you know, this is about you, but I, there's been many, you know, and I relate to what you're saying about these, these, um, these moments, you know, coming back to life almost, or, you know, living, an opening of the brain, I like to call it, you know, you're using, you know, some cerebral capacity that's never been used before, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. Because you've been watering it down with this exactly. and that and, and like everything like you say, else. the projection and yep. everything else, image consciousness. It's been there the whole time, ego, Danny. Ego, basically, in a nutshell, a lot of it is. Yep. It has been there the whole it's time. It's been there the whole time. But over time, we, un we unveil a little piece at a time of our true self, the people that we truly wanted to be. Now, I lived my life a long time being a person I didn't want to be. I didn't love myself. Got to drop the guard. Yeah, I didn't like myself at all. And exactly. And you've spent your life in a boxing ring being told to keep your guard up. Yeah. Now you've got to drop the guard in exactly. the metaphoric sense. Absolutely. It's mate. difficult to do, Danny, it when you're a defensive individual. Do. Very difficult. Spend your life in a boxing defensive. ring getting your ears <laughs> rubbered up. Yeah. And then people are saying, lighten up a wee bit. Yeah. You know, absorb. Yeah. Let us come to you. Take, you know, walk towards the light. That's it. And it's exactly. a difficult thing to do when you've been in a community where you've been seen to be a bit of a tough guy or a, you know, and you're trying to, you, you, it's hard to break, well, you know, I don't want them to think I'm soft. Yeah. So you're still trying to maintain that in the transition period. But in other breath, you're telling people that you're opening your arms up and you want a cuddle. Yeah. You know, instead of a high five. Exactly. Embrace me. And once that, once that, you know, once that, like you say, comes down, that I don't want, you said it yourself, you said it there. I don't want them to think this or I want them to think that. Once you stop concerning Morning. yourself with what another person might or might not be thinking, and it, because at the end of the day, another person's opinion of me at this point in my life couldn't mean any less to me right now, whereas once upon a time it almost ruled the person that I was. So I can safely say hand in heart for the first time in my life that I don't care. Yeah. I no longer read the comments and the this and the that. And I don't, Danny. Yeah. And I did, and yeah. I always did. Yeah. And now I don't. And it it was removing the anchor, it was taking the brakes off, it was losing a burden, it was such a physical weight. It's liberating. Big time. It, it was a physical weight. You could feel the burden of that fear and worry and the anxiety of what, you know, what do they think of me? 
wanting people to like you, mm -hmm. trying to project that you're a good person. Now it's just like me or don't. Yeah. It's not healthy to try and influence another person's opinion of you. It's very unhealthy, you know, very, very unhealthy, as I would say, as, as like I've said, I lived my life that way for a long time. Now, when somebody said to me about a year ago about, it was said in a conversation, you know, about, we got talking about somebody that I care, that I like a lot, you know, and uh, we got speaking, you know, as we do, and, and they said that, you know, what, what would your dad think of you? What would your granddad think of you? And that gave me something that I'd never thought of before, you know? I thought I wanted to be a little bit like my dad, a bit of a bad man, if you like, you know what I mean? And I, but I wasn't, it was never me, you know what I mean? I had the temperament to keep up that image, do you know what I mean? But when what, I, what matters to me now is if I die when I walk out of this room, or if I die tomorrow, or if I don't wake up in the morning, I need to work my life as if that it could be true. And, you know, like you said it before, be nice to people and not just that, not just be, not for the wrong reasons either. Not because you think you should be nice to these people. Be nice to these people because that's deeply who you are and who you want to be. And I mean, you know, I want my kids to, to, to be kids mainly get me thinking about this stuff. Do you know what I mean? And I, when, I, when I'm in the ground, which could be whenever we're not promised tomorrow i want i want to be secure in the satisfaction that i know my kids are going to recognize me as a person who was good for forget about what i've been through forget about what i've done forget about that stuff i want recognized by the people who matter to me the most not the outside world yeah the people who matter to me the most i want them recognized me as being a good person and if they can hold that up there to me that's eternal life you're living on through somebody else, through the person that you've been or the person that you're trying to become. You know, for me, that's worth, you know. One of the few things that I ever took out of, a positive thing, if you like, that I ever took out of my drug taking experiences yep. was when I smoked dimethyltryptyline. <laughs> Jesus. Now, I'm not glorifying that in any way, and I don't recommend anybody to do it. Let's get that clear. But when I'd done that, for whatever reason, it completely alleviated my fear of death like that. When I come round, some of it was mildly unpleasant. Some of it was very euphoric, the experience. But I remember never, ever fearing to die after the day that I took that. You know, and that's, if you like, something bad out of smoke something good that come out with smoke and a mind-boggling chemical but i remember thinking you know that i've got a lot of people in my life that i love and i've got a lot of people in my life that mainly immediate family that i would actually die for i'd rather live for them correct i'd rather live for them you know but i mean if the the opportunity or not the opportunity let's say the situation ever presented itself where me doing something or an act by me what would cost me my life would save that person. I would do it in a heartbeat. Yep. A heartbeat, I would do it. Yeah, it I would not that, be so. a, it wouldn't be a, because that, and that, that experience with that <clears throat> chemical gave me that, you know? And it's part of all the horrendous drug stories and things that I will not go into, you know <laughs> what I mean? Of me using over the past 20 years, of all of them. I wouldn't be too keen on taking it again. No. Ever. But out I can of see the attraction. But out of everything I've ever taken in my life, which is a whole spectrum of drugs, I won't go into what they are, that particular molecule gave me the ability and alleviated completely my fear of death. You know, and I, like I've just said, I could do that. And, I wouldn't, and it wouldn't take much of a thought process. The immediate recognition again. Yep. If I seen a situation where I know I could save this person that I loved, I would do it like that. What you could also, that that's a double-edged statement because I could say safely to you, respectfully across the table, maybe move a wee bit away from you, but <laughs> I could say that there's a wee trace there of you still trying to project that you are that person that will 
do anything effectively, you will step in front of that proverbial bullet. For specific people. Right, but you don't have to project it. Uh-huh. They know it anyway. They don't yeah. need they don't need you to feel that way. Yeah. You are much more usable to them here. Oh yes. You can't offer them protection when you're going down. No, I, I agree, mate, you know, and that's what I But I get your I'd much rather live for yeah, them. I get the know? intent and I get, you know, what you're trying to say there. Yeah. And I agree with you and I I feel completely the same. But avoidance at all cost of getting into those situations. Yeah. And if you live the right life, the right way, it should never happen. No. Worst case scenario, a random act, you can walk into anything. You know, the guy walking across London Bridge confronted with, and you have to fight for your life, that's just unavoidable. That's not, you know, there's, that's the gods at work. But I get you, I totally get you, and... You know, I know that I know you're. I know you are that type of person. You know, live by the sword, die by the sword. Warrior code. I get it. I can see it. You admit it. You know, you are built that way, and genetically, and you know, your DNA is just mapped for you. You're just that person. People say you can change, and you can change behaviours but you can't fundamentally change who you are. Absolutely not. The leopard can't change the spots. Mate, we talked about you it know. before, what we're interested in. Yeah. That's, if you like, genetic or spiritually yeah. encrypted. Yeah. It's hardwired in our very being. You know what I mean? You can't yeah. decide to be interested. You can't decide you can't, to be fun. You can't fake and it. And that comes right down to right down to the very, you know, the genome, the atom of who we are as people is already mapped out for us. Yeah. We're choiceless in that, in that situation. If I said... Danny, don't ever set foot in a gym again if you want to be my mate and don't ever hit a punch bag again. You would really struggle with that because you'd be like, that's just what I do. I feel comfortable with doing it. The f my energy flows when I'm doing that and I just, you know, I just lose myself in that moment, just hitting a bag, just throwing my hands and just feeling my way around that bag and connecting and feeling that shock going up my arms and yeah. absorbing that and then the aftermath sitting there cooling down in the gym, thinking about what you just done, you know, stretching your hands off. Just all of that is something that you do because you love it. Yeah. To be told never to do it again or have it taken away from you would be a completely alien Absolutely. emotion, you know. You'd be like, I, I need to do it. Yeah. I need to do that because that is me. Yeah. That's what I do. That's so, it. you know, it, it, it's good to always... Remind yourself that that side of you is there, and it's we live our life by events. Whatever you know, Carlisle, the you know the the borders, Cumbria, Egerman, all of these Whitehaven, all of these places are known for kind of tough, you know, residual guys. They're uh, the, the robust kind of fellas they're all I know a lot of guys down here for the the terriers and the lurcher game and stuff and they're all kind of tough guys in their own right they just seem to breed hard people down in the border city and, and all the way out and you know all yeah. the wee towns they're all tough guys you get in pubs in Egremont and Whitehaven and they're all like ha hands like ham hocks you know what I mean they're just yeah. built differently yeah who knows aye uh, so I suppose it's just in you and you don't need to chase it out. You don't need to try and exercise that. Yeah. Harness it correctly. Exactly. In the past, you used it socially to your advantage. What'd you say? Wallop, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Reputation up here. Everybody, well, that's Danny Christie. Don't get near him. What did it get you, Danny? Apart yeah. from sore hands. In prison. You know? Aye. That's all it gets you. Yeah. And it gets you the, the wrong kind of fan club. Yeah. Because the very ones, all right, mate, what a pint in the pub are the ones that don't like you. Yeah. And they're dying to see your downfall. Mm -hmm. Because you're physically and sometimes mentally a lot more capable than them. And by their weakness, you know, socially, they just hate you because you're a stronger, more charismatic kind of character than them. Charisma is also a double-edged sword. If you've got it in abundance and you're a charismatic guy, people hate it because by their makeup they're weak or they just don't have it naturally. 
they have to obtain it chemically, yeah. which is, you're never seeing the real person if someone's... It goes back to that comparison again, you know, yep. which can be very toxic. I'm, I'm, I'm fine for the first time in my life in my own skin. I can tell. I'm fine, mate. I can tell, mate. And I'll, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll stand alone in any environment surrounded by anybody. I don't fear anyone. I don't, I don't, I'm not an easily intimidated guy. I never was. Good luck to you. Yeah. You know, if you want to be the big guy in the room, good luck to you. Yeah. I'm over here drinking tea. I don't care what you're doing. Yeah. I don't need to project anything. At times in my life I did. And I was ruthless. But I was also reckless. Mm. And for what? S sorry to say, everybody loves the bad man. You know, everybody loves... No, they don't. No, they don't. No, the not. wrong people love you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... I want to be as far away from that version of myself, myself as 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 impossible to achieve. Yeah. Still maintaining myself and the knowledge that you know if you come and poke me with a stick, you will get a response. But but it would really have to be justified, and it it would really have to be a reason. And I'm not talking about sticks and stones. Yeah. You know I've had the worst the worst things you could ever say about somebody said about me. By faceless no marks, we you know hiding behind. Aliases. What does that mean? I'm, I'm not going to pay attention to you, as you say. You, you know, you you call somebody out and say, well, you know, if you want it, here it is. Let's mm -hmm. do it safely in a in a boxing ring, you know, in a you know a controlled environment where no one's going to get seriously injured or permanently disfigured and yeah. weapons and all of that, all of the bullshit, you know. Yeah. Any coward can lift a weapon. Try doing it in a ring with your hands. It's a whole different world. I remember walking into a boxing ring with a guy I'd been in training me, and he was twice the size, built like a brick shit house, and I was like, "That's no him." I don't remember him looking like that. And when he hit me, it, it was like, you know, it was like my brain was detached from my body because he could bang. And uh, initially, the trepidation passes, and it's game on. And uh, you give a fair, fairly decent account of yourself, and you know he, he was just strong and very powerful. And I've been in boxing rings and been hitting and sparring and stuff with guys. And sometimes a guy that you've sparred with a few times, nothing really out of this world happens. And then all of a sudden, one day, he just stings you because he just connects differently. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I didn't think you were capable of doing that. Yeah. You probably were in a little state of comfort and you didn't expect it and one day it just surprises you right in the button and wakes you up yeah and I remember underestimating a guy once because of bravado being out in the town in Plymouth which is a Dockers town it's a tough town yeah you know it's it's a tough place there are places in the UK that are just tough places Bristol's one of them Southampton's a tough town a lot of hard men in Southampton yeah don't go around there looking for it because you'll find it twice. <laughs> and uh, it was a family in Plymouth and a travelling family and this guy was well known. Everybody be like, oh, he's, he can go like a badger. And a couple of times, we, we, just, we just kept kind of looking at each other and I'm not like that. I'm not a steady kind of pet. I'm just not like that. But it just, and I got it in my head. I want you to be tested. I'll, I'll, I'll beat him. Says to my mate one night, and he's like, ah, go then. And we ended up fighting at three in the morning after being out all day drinking pints of Stella <laughs> and probably walloping a big donner kebab and fighting in Union Street in Plymouth. And he's the, he's the hardest guy I ever met. Because <laughs> he absolutely banjoed me up and down this alley. And my mate said, you won. He's like, you won that, you beat him. I was like, ah, you, you don't lie to me. I says, I don't feel like I beat him. And, uh, but, I did, but I did respect him. Mm -hmm. And he was wild, right? And he was like a honey badger. He could really, really fight. And he stuck his claws in me and stuff. And he just really, really... Aye, it was, a proper, it was probably the only real vicious fight I've ever been in in my life. It was br particularly a brutal, vicious fight. But I had so much respect for him. And my head was sore for six weeks. My neck, my jaw, my ears, everything hurt. Yeah. Every bit of me hurt. My hands were broke, you know, umpteen places. 
And I met that guy years later in a service station. I recognised him immediately. I went right over and went, how you doing? He's like, ah, looking at me. I went, do you remember me? And he, then he did. And you know, I felt really sorry for him because he looked exactly the same way he did then and he looked as if he didn't have anything. And uh, I was in a fairly decent position then and I don't know what made me say it. I, I, I hate offending people and I say, can I do anything for you? Can I help you? I felt like going into my pocket and giving him whatever I had and he's like, what do you mean? I went, are you getting on all right in life? How are you doing? And he, and he was a wee bit cagey, but he, he was all right. I'm not going to say what's really on my mind. I'll tell you later. Uh, I, I just felt something for the guy and I was like, Everybody used to point and talk about the, there was there was a family of brothers and they were all tough guys, but I don't think they had any education or anything like that. Or they were just tough. They were well known in Plymouth, and uh, yeah, I've never forgot him. Mm. I forgot all comers, all the rest of them. I forgot, but I've never forgot him. Right. It's easy to underestimate people in life. Absolutely, of course it is. And. Uh, you know, it's a real flaw in your character if you repeatedly underestimate people. Yeah. And that's when you'll be found out. There's always someone better out there, there's always someone smarter, and there's always someone that will outwit and outthink you. Yeah. Tenfold. Mm -hmm. You just haven't met them yet. Right. When you meet them, you'll know. Yeah. And that's the best education you'll ever get. I was just, you just brought me conveniently to my next point, mate. About, Go for it. about how those times that happen to us. You know, if you've got it, you're not if you're not stupid, and you're not a stupid man, and I know you're not. You know these times when you do get it wrong, yeah, and it costs you physically. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's a brilliant life lesson, right Big there, time. because you never ever forget that day. You know, <clears throat> I had a similar sort of experience once. I was done a bit of fighting here and there and everywhere. And um, we were at a taxi rank once. I think I was, I think I was twenty one. <clears throat> taxi rank down there in town, twenty one year old. Fight anybody, taking steroids. Fight anybody type attitude. You know what I mean? Um, big lad pushed in front of us in the taxi rank. I'm actually, he's actually like a brother to us. I love this lad now. First time I've ever met him. And isn't that just the irony of you know what happens when you tangle yeah. with these people? Um, pushed in front of us at the taxi rank. I was like, hey, I won't say what I said. I was swearing anyway, you know what I mean? I said, what are you doing there? Turn around and said, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> you little, you know. And Red I just, bag to a bull. And I just said, turn round, because he turned his back on us after he said that. I said, turn round. Mate, and I hit this lad. Well, I don't know if it was, it was at least five excellent punches might yep. I add fast I mean? hands it might have been six but I had full feedback with every one of them and I remember as the second and third and fourth were gone in I was thinking wow yeah this boy is just mate it was like I remember him punching a brick wall once he hit me and I landed on the white line in the middle of the road and I woke up I was told it was about 30 seconds afterwards and my best mate he was with a gang of lads my best mate peeled us off the floor He'd already been tangling while I was while I was sparked out. It's a lesson. And um, I got in touch with him about the phone rang actually about two weeks later, <laughs> and he said, "You were that, you were that quick-handed little cunt from down the taxi rank <laughs> that I had you." <laughs> and I was like, "Hi, mate, that was me." I was, and I remember saying, "Are we all right, like?" And he was like, "Oh, we're all right, mate. Where? Yeah, I'm coming to get you to drink." And mate, I've been good mates with him ever since, you know. Just like that, eh? Mm -hmm. See, it doesn't always need to end badly, does it? No. Confrontation. Well, even I mean, even I can even I can even say that about so many people that have fought in the ring. Not everybody have fought in the street, but you know, I didn't really want to make. I'm gonna fight I had last year that everybody's seen. Yep. Now, I never mention that <laughs> name or anything like that. No. But there was. We briefly spoke about this. A level of hatred which was astronomical. Mm -hmm. Something I've never experienced before towards one individual. Now, even though I know what I know, I never ever thought it would be possible.
for me to have a shred of respect. Now that exchange brought a shred and this shred only exists through one aspect, which is fighting. That's the only place it exists. It doesn't exist or apply to any other part of character or personality. That's all the same. But I think with that come an alleviation of hatred. You know, one, because it was no good for me ever to have that going on in my life. You know what I mean? It was toxic. It was very damaging and it was consuming. But something happened that I never thought would happen. Do you know what I mean? And I have to go, aye, all right, mate. That was, you know, all right. And see, that done something to me as well. You know, it gave me a bit of relief, if you like. Do you know what I mean? And it was like the fact that I know what I know and this thing that happened, you know what I mean? Kind of done something. Do you know what I mean? Elaborate. It was strange. It allowed me to respect on a very, very small section of the substrata that is the enormity of respect. Yep. It allowed me to do something that I never thought I would be capable of doing. You know, even if I'd have been laid flat in 10 seconds, I didn't think that would happen. I wouldn't have, I did, just didn't think that that would gonna happen. The fact that it did happen, you know, was eye opening to me. Because no matter what the outcome, if you went through that a million times, I still never thought in my mind that that would be at all possible for me to hold that, you know what I mean? Because it's all right knowing somebody can do something. It's all right knowing somebody can do this. It's all right everybody telling you that something can do this. Proving it's a whole different kettle when of When you were in there and you've certainly done that, boy. And you're in there and you're feeling it, you know what I mean? It's different, like I say, it done something. And that was, I think, you know, a bit of an eye-opener. Yep. Do you know what I mean? And it was... Uh, it was what it was, you yeah, know. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty brutal event. It certainly blew up, and Aye. you know, you got my respect absolutely a hundred percent. I think you got everybody's, regardless of anyone's side. I don't really, you know, go vocal on it. <clears throat> I was interested in it for the kind of aftermath. I was more interested in what would happen happen after the event. I think it's always more interested seeing people's uh, interest in seeing people's responses to an event like that. Public don't understand a lot of what's going on here in the back history. Mm -hmm. And my investment in it is because on a personal level, myself and that individual sat down and I did say to him, there's been some things said, so what do you bring to the table to prove that you're not that guy? Uh, you know, since appears that the stuff was obviously fabricated and, you know, hindsight is great as well. I would never have, I would never be sharing a room with somebody like that. And I did say to him that don't lie about this because you'll, you'll make a bad enemy of me. Don't do that. And it'll only be me. Mm -hmm. I don't do team handed stuff and calling names and it'll just be me that you've got a problem with mm -hmm. and uh, I says and I don't really care about you but I'll be more than enough for you uh, if we go if we go if we get to that mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I was really I was really disappointed that it was that person because it just it just adds to the did whole you, did you feel fooled? not at all anybody can fake it Danny uh, not at all more disappointed that it's so easy to put yourself out there as anything as anything mm -hmm. And you can do what you want and you can access anybody and anybody can work with kids and all the rest of it. And it just shows you what a shit show the whole thing is that he can go out there and build a platform as big as he has, selling books off of fake things and all the rest of it, right? That fake fight, you know, with a former 
out Lonsdale belt winner outright British Commonwealth right. and European champion an absolute, on my an absolute monster of a man right I've seen him live I've seen him twice I've I've been six feet away from the guy uh, I mean no disrespect to the fella he's obviously been bunged with a couple of quid to have a spar and if you watch that incident and this might sound cryptic going out to people that don't really know what we're talking about. We're talking about a staged fight for a staged title controlled by these London boys. And uh, I, to, to then sell books off of that and then sell an image and try and build a platform off of that is, is what make, it's what disappoints me, how easy it is to do, mm -hmm. that people will not do their due diligence and their homework and actually go right and watch the, the footage and say that's clearly fake that's clear that big guy is clearly I mean you're mm -hmm. talking about a guy that shared the ring with Klitschko and Tyson and mm -hmm. come on Aye, even in his worst day he would kill you he's Aye. a stone cold killer he was a professional mm -hmm. who did win Lonsdale belts and European titles and all the rest of it and fought several world champions and ridiculous absolutely yeah. ridiculous Aye, but we know that yeah. And and again, and we're aware. As long as we're aware, as long as we know what what we're trying to do this for, and what we're trying to expose here, uh, and it will be exposed. And you know, truth will prevail, and good always beats evil, mm -hmm. always. Well, I'm kind of glad, glad. You know, not I don't celebrate it if you like, but it's a good thing that the right people are still trying to do the right thing. Let's shall we say, right? Now, hell of a spectacle. Absolutely, you know, and I'm not, I'm not. I'm not it's because that level of emotional hatred or it, you know, that thing it doesn't bother me. So I'm not so disappointed that we've you know sort of swerved onto this topic, you know. But I, I, I think I'll we'll move on, and I think I'll put yeah. it to bed like this. Yeah. You know, when I was invited or coerced, shall we say, into that event, you know, and there was an inner feeling of satisfaction which I never projected because I knew the day wherever it was, that me and him ever crossed eyes and we shared the same. It didn't matter what we shared. Now, it wouldn't have been mattered where it was. You know, I'm just, when that feeling came, you know, I was elated in a way, knowing that this was never, ever going to happen in the local Asda or something, because no. it really would have been a case of... It was the volcano erupting. Clean up aisle five, please, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, and it would have been that, you know? So in a way, you know, and when it was over... I thought it was put to bed. The fact that it wasn't put to bed was purely because of me. Now, I knew that situation would have carried on and potentially carry on because, you know, it's business on the other side, I suppose. Now, it took a little while, but the, I put it to bed. In the end, after a little bit of post back and forth, I put it to bed for myself personally, for my own personal growth, because no doubt about it, that person lived up there for a while. Now, he isn't there. Nobody is there, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're definitely healthier. And, um, yeah, it feels good. Massively. It feels good, you know. I know we're going to move on, but it does feel good when the thoughts and the conversations like now are invited in. There's no stirring things like there always was. You know what I mean? That's gone, alleviated, extinguished, diminished. This week's podcast is sponsored by Tantalise Beauty, specialising in lash and brow treatments, lash products and lash training. Find them on their website and follow them on Instagram. The link will be in the description. Thank you. <laughs>